All right, so uh, kind of shifting gears into our message today. Um, there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way. So a couple days ago, or actually the week before Easter, Brittany and I had the opportunity to sneak away for a few days and go fishing with my family. And so we went camping at a place called Clark Hill Lake, uh, which is uh, on the kind of in the, on the Savannah, it is on the Savannah River. And so we were able to spend some days, uh, some time there fishing. I spent a lot of that time out with my dad on his uh, small boat. And, but one day, Brittany wanted his fish from the shore. Now, before I tell this story, I need you all to realize that when Brittany and I go fishing or camping, anything that could go wrong does. All right, there's my disclaimer. So Brittany's like, hey, let's go fishing from the shore. And so what we decided to do was we were like, hey, well, we'll, we'll put rigs on there um, called a, a Carolina rig, if I'm not mistaken. It has two hooks on it and a weight at the bottom. You put a worm or whatever you want there. You throw it out. You let it sit. You hope for the best, right? So that's what we were going to do. So there was a spot right down from where our campsite was that had a little bit of a clearing. And so I'm like, Brittany, we can fish right there. As long as we don't hit this tree here and this tree here, we're fine. It's wide open, and it was large enough like you couldn't throw it across the, the way even if you wanted to. So we get to the spot, and everything was going well. So I thought. Cast number two is when things went downhill. So I rear back, I throw it, and they throw it right into the center of this huge tree right here beside me. I'm like, okay, that's not good. So I start reeling it up. It goes down from the water back to the top, comes down, shake it, pops it out. Everything's fine. Um, line got all messed up, had to untangle all that. So then I'm like, okay, 10 minutes later, I'm like, now, all right, we're ready to fish. No more than about the time I thought that. Brittany throws hers to the top of that tree, and it's now stuck up here to the point where we're spending about 10 minutes trying to pull it and we can't get it down. My dad walks down there, um, and embarrassed probably, um, he walks down and, um, and breaks the line and uh, we get it all figured out. And I was actually trying to pull it and hold the line and almost like cut my fingers off, but that's beside the point. So, um, and I told Brittany when we got done with that, I said, Brittany, we're better than this. Like we're better than this. Like I grew up, we grew up going fishing all the time. You would think that I would be able to know what to do in these situations? Apparently, I don't. So we go to an open area over by the shore because, hey, you can't get anything stuck anywhere there, right? Which would have been the smart place to go to begin with, but hey, whatever. So we go to this open area, and I kid you not, 20 minutes later, we're walking back to the campsite with no hooks, no bait, no weights, because it all got hung on the bottom of the lake. And that happened like four times. There has to be a better way. For us, the better way was take your poles, put them back in the truck, go take a nap. <laughs> and you know what? That worked out well. It worked out well. So uh, there has to be a better way. Well, if you guys have a Bible, and I hope you do, uh, go with me to Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to continue our look in the book of Hebrews. We're going to look at verses 19 through 25. And what we're going to see today is, is that the writer is going to explain to these uh, Hebrew believers that there is a better way. And because there is a better way, there is a response that we are to have in light of that better way. And what we're going to see is, is that God offered a better way through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. And because of that sacrifice, we now have the boldness to enter into his presence. And we have the boldness to be, or we have the ability to be with him. And because we have this unlimited access, the writer is going to give us three ways that we respond to that, and we'll get there in a minute. But, uh, but that's what we're looking at. So if you guys are there, Hebrews 10, 19 through 25, um, if you're there, say, found it. All right, let's stand to get, read together if you're physically able. And we're going to read verses 19 through 25, and then we're going to look, at, uh, look deep into this text this morning. So this is the word of the Lord. Hebrews 10, 19, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters... Since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus, so he has inaugurated for us a new and living way through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed in pure water. Let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering, since he who promised is faithful." And let us watch out for one another to provoke, one another to provoke love and good works, not neglecting to gather together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day approaching. One line of the sermon, this is it. 
Jesus offers believers a way to God, but he requires our response. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for just this time. Lord, you teach us today. We've opened your word. Father, open our hearts. And Father, we just give you all the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So if you were to go back and read Hebrews up to this point, particularly looking at chapter 10, and this is like our ninth week in Hebrews, so we're we're trusting that y'all know what we're talking about by the time we get to this point. But what we see is we see a lot of links back to the Old Testament sacrifices, the Levitical laws as they call them. And Pastor Jeff discussed much of this last Sunday whenever he talked about how um, the, the high priest would go on the Day of Atonement and make sacrifices to the Lord on behalf of the people. Um, that, that, that sacrifice would be the ultimate sacrifice to cleanse the people from their sin. But it had to be done in a certain way by a certain individual, the high priest, following regulations and different things handed down by God. And if it was not done to that exact like handwritten way that's been passed down, then it was no good and it would be devastating for the people. And so the high priest would spend a week or more going through these processes, making sure that, that he was completely clean. And it's this idea of being a perfect sacrifice before God. And so he would purify himself. He'd spend all night praying, meditating on Scripture. And he would just continue to do these things over and over and over again because, again, if things weren't done exactly right, it would not have been good. And so uh, some actually say, just kind of a fun fact, that the priest would actually wear a bell around his ankle just so when he goes in to make the sacrifices, they could tell if he was still alive or not. That's how serious this was. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but you think your job is stressful? That's kind of stressful. Thank you for laughing. The other service didn't do that. All right. <laughs> but, that's, but again, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what, that's what people say. Now, if you go back and look at chapter 10, what we see is, is the writer spends a lot of time talking about your heading of your Bible may say the perfect sacrifice. And so he's talking about Jesus being that perfect sacrifice and now what that means. And so, I mean, he actually even calls out the entire sacrificial system and he, and he tells them that, hey, those sacrifices that you offered never actually did anything. And if you don't believe me, go look at Hebrews 10.4. Because Hebrews 10.4, it says, for it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. And so basically he's saying none of that mattered. So year after year, the people of of God would come and make these sacrifices. Now, again, this was a system that was set up. This was set up uh, to offer sacrifices to God. So it was in full motion. But the reality is, is that it wasn't the bulls or the goats or anything like that or that blood that actually made the sacrifice. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, he's saying these sacrifices never did it. But the one sacrifice that did is Jesus Christ himself with his own body and his own blood. That was the ultimate sacrifice. It served as a true sacrifice once and for all. So here's the reality. Jesus is above all sacrifices, above all sacrifices. And so knowing that, keeping that, this is is leading us up to verse 19. Here's what the writer says. It says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have boldness to enter the sanctuary through the blood of Jesus. Now, This idea, this boldness of entering into the sanctuary is entering into the presence of God. And some of you may be thinking, well, wait, we have have this access to enter into the presence of God, 100%. When when Jesus Jesus came, uh, we were given access to him. Now think back to when they offered these sacrifices. Only the high priest could enter into the presence of God. The people could make sacrifices to God, but they never could actually enter into the presence of God where it dwelled. And so he would have to go in, and year after year, this would happen. And and so one of the things that we have to understand is that if you lived in this time, if we were to go and go to the temple to make sacrifices, what would happen is is there would be a certain spot where we could go over here to make our sacrifice, but after that, we'd have to pass that off to somebody else, and then it would be passed off to somebody else, and on and on until the high priest goes in and makes the, the, the big sacrifice that covers all of it. And when I think about that, and I don't know if you ever thought about it this way, but it makes it sound like the Old Testament was all about barriers. And if you think about it, it was. Because there were only certain places you could go, there were only certain things that you could do, and, there, and, and you never really had that direct access to God. And they were limited because of that. But since the coming of Jesus, all that changed. Everything changed in that, that moment. And so not only do we have direct access to him, but we now can enter into the very presence of God and approach God with what? Confidence and boldness. 
The, the Greek term that's used here is a term called parousia. And what that, what that mean, word means is, is that it's man's freedom based on or because of his new relationship with God. So we now have this new relationship with God. We, we have this ability to now enter in and approach God with boldness. When I think about this idea of approaching God, it makes me think about Zechariah. And you're probably thinking, Zechariah, what in the world? But if you think about Zechariah, so in Zechariah, particularly in, uh, in Zechariah 3, he has this vision of Joshua, the high priest, who he's about to go and step into the temple. And before he goes into the, the, the Joshua is about to go in and step into the temple, this angel of the Lord comes and he's like, wait, don't do that. Why? Because Joshua wasn't pure. The high priest wasn't pure. He was, he was covered in filth. And so if he would have gone in there, like I mentioned earlier, before God covered that way, it wouldn't have been good. He had to be clean. And then we see this beautiful transition in Zechariah 3, 9, where it says this, I will take away the iniquity of this land in a single day, foreshadowing what Christ was going to do. Ladies and gentlemen, that's what Christ did for you and I. He's the ultimate sacrifice. If we believe in him, trust in him, understand the fact that he died, he, he, he died, he rose again for you and I, and what he did on the cross actually happened, we now can approach him and enter into the presence with boldness and confidence. But it doesn't stop there. Keep reading. Verses, uh, verse 20. It says, He inaugurated for us a new living way through the curtain that is through his flesh. And so what we see here is, is that moment on the cross when the curtain, there was this thick curtain that separated uh, the, the holiest of the holies, where only the high priest would go, where the presence of God was, uh, was, was dwelling. That curtain was then split from top to bottom. And just like that, now those who believe in him had that access. And now given direct access to approach Jesus. We have this new and living way through Jesus and his sacrifice on the cross. As simple as that message sounds, that message is very offensive to a lot of people. What I mean by that is, is there are, uh, are, are a lot of people that, 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 that tend to think that, you know what, it doesn't matter what I believe in. It doesn't matter um, how I get there. God is God. That's all that matters. I like to look at it this way. Um, when Brittany and I first, uh, when we were married, uh, what, 2016, we spent our honey, we went on our honeymoon to the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. Now, anybody like to go on hikes and that kind of thing? Or, you, or maybe you've been on a hike and you don't like it, but that's fine too. We all know what we're talking about. If you go hiking in a place like a national park, if you do not have a map, that could go seriously wrong. I'm not telling a story about that. But my point is, is that there's different trails. And the reason why there's different trails is some are hard, some are easy. And so it just depends. Do you want to risk your life on the trail or do you want the easy shortcut on the trail? Right? I take the easy shortcut. Amen? So you can either go a mile or you can go 25 miles. Right? And it all leads to one destination, typically. Not all of them, but typically you have that. A lot of people think of Christianity that way. That it doesn't matter which path I take. It doesn't matter which way that I go. God is still God. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if I decide to, to take the route of Muhammad. It doesn't matter if I decide to go with Hinduism. It doesn't matter whatever I pick, I'm still going to get there. I'm here to tell you today, that is a lie. And, and what culture is trying to push is, it doesn't matter what you believe in, because God is still God. It doesn't matter. That's not true. Look at, remember what Jesus, told, uh, Jesus said in John 14, 6. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. But then he made this very, very bold statement. He said, nobody gets to the Father except through me. Jesus talking about himself. Jesus is the only way. And it's only through him that we now have this boldness to enter into the presence of God. And this is critical to understand in our world today because, again, many people are shopping around for what best works for them. Making their faith and their religion what is better for them and making it all about them rather than the one who it's truly supposed to be about. But the reality is, is no matter what the culture says, it's not about you. It's about serving the one who lived a life for you, serving the one who died for you, and the one who rose from the grave for you. That's what it's about. And I think oftentimes in churches, we can also make our Christian faith about us. What is it we want? What is it that we want to do? What is my preference? And we kind of can take God completely out of the picture if we're not careful. And so we, we, all, we do need to be careful. I also think that we come through the motions. 
But we come Sunday in and Sunday out, and we go through the motions, and we tend to overlook who we are in Christ. It blows me away that people who, who, who have come to know the Lord, who are all about Jesus and all that kind of stuff, and then they tell me, I don't need the local church. To hate the local church is to hate what Jesus died for. So that, that can't happen. And I, and I get it. There's things that, that go on and people get upset and complain and different things like that. But we need to look past that and focus on the main thing. When we begin to complain about stuff that's about our preferences, what we're basically saying is saying, all right, God, I'm just going to tag you on to everything that I want you to do rather than us serving him and making it about him. And so do we even understand, like, there's people that have come that just they take it and leave it, and then they just move on like it's no big deal. Do we understand that we have the greatest news that we could ever have within us? When we gather together as believers, when we come together as a body, it should be like Super Bowl Sunday every day. I told the last service over there, that last service last Sunday for Easter Sunday was packed. And I'm not talking about necessarily just packed because of people in the room. Like that, that, it was just an amazing worship experience that we had in there. The Spirit of God was definitely moving. But yet there's so many that, that just can just come and take it or leave it. We got to be careful not to make things about our preferences, but to keep him in the focus. And how refreshing is it to know that we can come before a holy God, blameless, no matter what we've done, no matter our past, no matter our struggles, no matter what we still continue to struggle with, no matter what we're going to struggle with in the future, that we can still come to God with boldness through the blood of Christ. Amen. So refreshing that we're forgiven by him, we're blameless before him. So in light of all that, how do we respond? And this is where the writer then makes a transition. He's saying, hey, you now have the boldness to enter into the sanctuary. You, have the, the, you can have confidence to come to know him. And then he picks it up here in the first one. So here's our first response. Our first response of three is we are to draw near to Jesus. Draw near to Jesus. Look at Hebrews 10, 21 through 22. It says, since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. So what verse 22 is saying here, let us draw near. He's not talking to the priest. He's not talking to the pastors. He's talking to every single person who calls on the name of Jesus, draw near to him. Let us draw near to him. But then look at what he says. He says, with a true heart. He says, come with a true heart. Like this is not, this is not just coming and going with our preferences. This is coming with a surrendered heart to him. Not doing it out of obligation, but boldly approaching God with a heart that longs for him. So we're coming to him, longing to be with him. We draw with a true heart, but listen to this. He says, with full assurance of faith. And that's truly believing and trusting in the work, the finished work of the cross. A few years ago, we did a series with our students called Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Heart. And that series was all about assurance of salvation. The reason why we, we did that particular series, and we spent like eight or nine weeks on it, the reason why we did it was I had so many students coming up to me and saying, how do I know if I'm actually saved? How do I know that I can have assurance in my salvation? Is it because I said a prayer? Is it because my parents were saved? Is it because I grew up in church? Is it like, what, what's the point? What, what, is all, what, is it, what does it mean? How do I know? Because I feel like I just don't know. And as we went through that series, I'm not all that convinced that students are the only ones with that problem. I think we wouldn't admit it sitting in here today, but there's a lot of people sitting in this room today that I guarantee you are still struggling with that. How do I know if I'm saved? How can I be truly sure that I'm saved? Look, knowing your assurance in salvation boils down to one thing. Well, really two. Two options. Either you believe what Jesus did or either you don't. If you believe in who he is, you call on his name, you're saved, you're assured. If you do not believe in him, then you're not. It's that simple. And I think we like to overcomplicate this. It's, and here's the reality is, one, uh, one, one uh, scholar put it this way, he said, God grants assurance not on the basis of man's faith, but on the basis of Christ's faithfulness. See, here's the thing is, it's not about what we do. It's not about what we've done. It's not about what we can bring to him. It's what Christ has already done for you on the cross back here. And so we need to constantly be reminded to look back to the cross, look back to him and say, you know what? I know I'm assured in my salvation because Jesus did exactly what his word says he did. And I trust and I believe that. 
think of it this way. When I met Brittany, we went through the dating process. Uh, we met at UNC Pembroke in a class that was awful. And that's a story for another day. But it was by divine appointment that we met. And so here's, here's what ended up happening. So we, we dated for a couple of years, or about a year and a half. And then finally, I was like, you know what? I need to ask her to marry me before somebody else does. Because I realized that I was out of my league. It's okay. I admit it. It's fine. <laughs> You're never good enough for, your, for the father, right? Um, so anyway... So I go, and I talk to Bob, and I ask for Brittany's hand in marriage, and all that went well. And, and so then we decide, you know what, all right, I'm, Brittany and I were planning to go on a hike. And, and so, um, so I had this day set up. I spent all the money that I had at that time on a ring. And um, so then I was broke, which was awesome. So, so then I, I, we go on this hike. And now everything, again, that could go wrong did kind of go wrong, but it ended up well because... This hike was supposed to be just Brittany and I, but um, somehow Brittany ended up dog-sitting um, for uh, Deborah Stewart, who's a church member here. So we had Deborah's dog with us. And then um, Morgan McDonald, Danny's daughter, uh, he, she came up. She's like, hey, I want to go hiking with y'all. Brittany's like, sure, come on with us. I'm like, no. <laughs> so we had a whole crew, right? So we're loading up in the car, and we go to Raven Rock uh, at State Park. And Raven Rock State Park is in Harnett County, not too far from here. And, and you know, if you've ever been there, there's this, this kind of, not really a long trail, but you walk down this trail, and then there's just this huge rock, and then right under that rock is where I proposed to her. It's cool, right? Brittany got so mad at me that day because I ran ahead of her because she didn't know what I was doing. And then, and then as she was mad at me, I was like, will you marry me? <laughs> Are you serious? No, I'm joking. Like, here's the ring. Um, but here's my point. I bought that ring to show a symbol of my love for her. And, and so then we sealed that two years later in 2016. So that was April of 2014. And then in October of 2016, we gathered together before God, friends, and family, and we were married. And so now we have this ring on our finger that every time I look at her, every time she looks at hers, we can be assured of our love for each other. We're committed to each other in marriage before God. Made that commitment. The only way out is death, Right? So, but my point is, is so, so, we, so we did that, and, and in a similar way, we look back at the cross. For us, we have the image of the cross. We have what Jesus did for us on the cross. So when you start to think, man, am I saved? Am I not saved? Look back to that. And that paints a picture to say, yes. You believe in what Jesus did. You believe that he died with you. You confess he's, he is Lord of your life. Yes, you can be assured that you're saved. Amen. That's what assurance boils down to. And so we draw near to God, assured that we're saved. And then he writes, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. Again, reference to the Levitical sacrifices here. So now we believers can enter into the presence boldly. We can do so believing in God, assured that God is, is who he says he is. And then in the latter half of it, we're confident that, of what Jesus did. And then in verse 22, he says, draw near to him because the blood of Jesus cleanses us. The, imistra, Im, the imagery that we, that we see here in this text for us is baptism. When you get baptized, you, when we go over here and we do baptism, when you go down, you're buried in the water of baptism, buried in Christ, and then risen up into a new life in him. And so it's a symbolize, it symbolizes Jesus' life, his sacrifice, his death, and then him raising again. It's not the idea that the water changes you, but it's this symbolic picture that, that a new life with Jesus is completely clean. And it remains that way. And it's a symbol of the internal work of what Christ has accomplished in our life. And so we draw near to God, assured in our salvation because of what Jesus has done on the cross. And you might be thinking, okay, Andrew, I, I do that all the time. I come to church. I serve at the church. I do all these different things. I'm here every Sunday, Wednesday, and every other day the church is open. I hear you. Casual church attendance or even faithful church attendance is not enough. Again, there's, never, there's not anything that we can do to bring to the table here. But here's my question. What does your life look like? Not when you're here. But what does our lives look like when we're not here? What does our life look like? What does our thought life look like? What are we thinking about? How do we respond to others? How do we treat others? Do those line up 
with what we say we believe. One of my favorite authors, best book I've ever read, one of the best books I've ever read, his name's Donald Whitley, or Whitney, or excuse me, Donald Whitley, and he writes a book called Spiritual Disciplines for the Christian Life. I think every believer should read that book. I, read, I try to read through that book at some point every year, but it goes through various spiritual disciplines, and it's an excellent read, highly recommend it. But he said this, he said, worship is focusing and responding to God. When we look at the life of Jesus, we see a repetition of Jesus leaving the disciples in the crowds, and he does what? Draws away to pray, to meditate, to get into the presence of God, to draw near to him, a quiet place to draw near to him. If Jesus saw an importance of drawing near to God, shouldn't we? And, and I know it's hard, but, but I mean, it, it blows me away. I was, I'm doing some research this week. Um, for, a, for a project that I had to turn in yesterday for my, my, doctor, my doctoral stuff. And I'm not going to say what the number was because I don't want to get it wrong, but one of the, one of the things I put into this, this paper was the fact that Bible intake and prayer is at an all-time low among those who are active and claiming to be believers in Christ. Active in the local church, but also claiming to be believers in Christ. Something's not right about that. How can we draw near to Jesus without opening his word, reading his word, reflecting on his word, meditating in his word, praying and talking to him, voicing out those things to him? We can't do it. And some say, well, I listen to Christian music and all that stuff. That's great. That, that's definitely a side of worship. But we have the access, the bold access to be able to approach him with confidence. He wants us to approach him. Jesus even modeled that for us, so are we doing that? We need to draw near to him. So let me ask us this, these questions this morning. Reflect on this. Are we seeking God in our life daily? Are we drawing near to him? Can people see that we have an assurance and a hope in him? Parents, are you modeling that to your kids? Showing them the importance of what it means to, as, as the Shema says in Deuteronomy 6, to train up your children in the ways of the Lord. Are we doing those things? Let us draw near, spend time in prayer with him, worshiping him with our lives and committed to him as a response to what Jesus did on the cross. So that's the first one. First one, we draw near to God. The second one, we cling to Jesus. Cling to Jesus. And we see this in uh, Hebrews 10, 23. He says, let us hold on to the confession of our hope without wavering since he who promised is faithful. What the writer's saying here is he's saying, hold on tight, do not let go. In fact, hold on as if your entire life depends on it is how this, this, this text reads in the language. Don't let go, keep going. And, and, and what he's been doing is telling us everything that we've already been saying here all along, the fact that Jesus saves, but he's saying, don't let go. This is the greatest hope that we could ever have. Don't lose hope. And this isn't the idea that, that you can lose your salvation. It's not the idea of anything like that. Basically, this is saying that, that it's hoping, it, it's the idea of hoping that something would happen. It's not that. It's the idea of being confident in God's promises and your hope being rooted in the foundation of Christ. So it's not about what's to happen. It's about hoping and holding on to his promises and gripping those promises tight, even when things get difficult. And it says to hold on without wavering. Some translations may say to hold on tightly. Um, when I was reading this text, it reminded me of an article that I came across a couple years ago. And the title said, uh, Hang Gliding Passenger Holds On for Dear Life. That got my attention. Also came with a video. It was terrifying. But here's basically what happened. So hang gliders, you know how those work. You, you hold on to a bar, you're strapped in, you jump off a cliff, and you just soar around, right? That's hang glider. Well, this guy signed up to do this hang gliding excursion somewhere, and he was going to do it just kind of like when you jump out of a plane with another person, they, they do a tandem. Well, it was going to be like that. And so he's supposed to be strapped on to this other person. Problem was, once they got about mid, not even mid-flight, really once they jumped off the cliff, the instructor realized that they forgot to strap him on. Yeah, I don't know what the lawsuit ended up being, but I'm, it was probably a good one. Um, so here's what happened, and I can say this because he was fine, preface this. 
But here's what happens. So they get in the air, and all of a sudden, this guy's hanging on, obviously, to anything that he can grab onto. He does not have a parachute. He does have on the, the, the jumpsuit, but they had nothing to strap him on with. And so, so he's going, and he's holding on. He's holding on to the instructor's leg. He's holding on to this bar. And in fact, they said that he held on so tight that he tore his bicep from about right here all the way down. Talk about hanging on so tight, holding on to a bar so tight that it rips your entire muscle right here. And so he held on to this, this bar because his life depended on it. That's the same image that the writer's kind of ref- giving right here. And again, this guy landed on this thing. He was fine. It, it was whatever. Everything worked out. But the writer of Hebrews is telling us to hold on tight and don't let go to the hope that you have in Christ. Don't let that go. As difficult as it may be, don't abandon this. Hang on to God's faithful promises. Don't look in other directions. He's saying, hang on, stay focused on his faithfulness, just like the psalm that we just sung a second ago. Many pastors nowadays like to preach uh, something that we we call a prosperity gospel. You won't hear that here. But um, one of the things that they like to say is, is that, hey, if you'll trust in Jesus, if you'll put your faith in Christ, everything's going to get better. I heard one person, um, not going to say who it was, but one prosperity preacher, um, Brittany and I, um, came across something on, and heard it on the radio and couldn't believe it. But he said, if you put your faith in Christ, you're going to get that job promotion. If you put your faith in Christ, you're going to get a raise. If you're going to put your faith in Christ, you, you do this and do that. Your life's going to get completely better according to the ways of the world is basically how that's interpreted. And the reality is, is we know as believers, if we put our faith in Christ, yes, our life does get better. But your life's not going to get better based on your wants, your desires, and your material needs. In fact, remember what Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 10, 22. It's a verse that we like to overlook. But he said, you will be hated by everyone because of my name. Hated by everyone because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Church, the reality is trials will come. Difficulty will come. We will be tested by this world. But what the writer of Hebrews is saying to these believers here as well is saying, Be encouraged that while right now this world is a mess, this world is difficult, and it's not getting any better, hold on. God has a plan to restore it back to the way it was intended to be. God wanted us to be his people living in perfect harmony in union with him, free of sin, free of all these different things that hold us back and that stress us out and all these different things, God has that plan and that plan will be set in motion when his son comes back. Amen. That is the hope and the promise that we hold on to. And so hold on tight to that. Again, to use the language of this text. Uh, I, I've, always, I've always been uh, impressed by those who can run marathons. Uh, I don't run marathons because I just don't want to do it. But those who do run marathons, what they do is they have to set goals and, and different markers. So that way, they, when they, they get to a certain point, they know they've got X amount to go, or they, they have to eat a certain thing to get more energy, or whatever it be. They have these things set up. And the reason why they do that is to stay focused on finishing the race. You have to plan, you have to stick with it, you've got goals, and you have to follow that plan. Because at some point in a marathon or in a long race, you're going to hit the wall. And you got to push through that wall. And just like if we're in a race and we hit the wall, the writer of Hebrews is telling us, don't get knocked down. And if you do get knocked down, which maybe you will get knocked down, get back up and keep going. Continue on. Hold on to his faithfulness. Hang on to his promises. Don't give up. So we draw near to God. We hold on tight to to those promises. We hold on tight to Jesus. We hold firmly in that. And then in verse 24, we see the final response. And that final response is to encourage and love one another. As body of believers, encourage and love one another. Here's what it says in verse 24. Let us consider one another in order to provoke love and good works. See, the reality is, is we're called to be a people, a community, that loves and supports one another. And this is vital for, for us as, as believers, particularly to keep pressing on in the faith as a community and keep doing awesome things for God. Um, growing up, I had the opportunity to go to a lot of college basketball games. Uh, many of them were at, at Duke, but um, NC State, Carolina, like wherever it was to see basketball, I've seen, I've seen games in every arena there in, in the triangle of those teams. 
But one of the, one of the things that I often notice with, with basketball players is, is, is um, when you go and you watch them, particularly get there early and watch them warm up, what are they doing? They're, 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 they're doing layup drills, right? They're, 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 I played basketball, so this is going to get animated. I'm going to try not to fall off the stage. So, so they're doing their layup drills and all that kind of stuff. And as they're doing those drills, they run back into the line, high five, high five, high five, or a hug or something like that. They're hyping each other up. They're encouraging each other. Do the same thing with their shooting drills. They'll shoot a shot and then run back into the line, high five. Well, when the game starts, you see the same thing. The same theme keeps going on. And so even when they shoot free throws, so they'll come to the line, they'll shoot their free throws, and then as they shoot it, whether they make or miss, what happens? You see players come up here, 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 encouraging each other and all that kind of stuff. And the same thing at the end of the game, when the game's over, win or lose, you got players hugging each other, loving each other, encouraging each other, and all that kind of stuff. That's a lot of encouragement for a basketball team. But one of the things I started thinking about is, is, is Maybe they're encouraging each other because they're that united. They believe in each other. They truly love each other. See, this is what happens when a team is unified. When a team is so unified, they're encouraging, they're, they're, they're reaching out, they're, they're showing love. When they get knocked down, you got somebody there to pick you up. Even in a basketball game, if you go up for a layup and you get fouled, real quickly, two or three guys from your team come to pick you up, help you get up and go to the foul line. They're unified as one. They say it's all good, keep going. Likewise, this is also a mark of the local church. Unity, trust, to encourage and love. The church exists for the equipping of believers as well as the encouraging and loving of one another and pushing one another to do good works. One of the best ways we can live a response in in a positive response to God and what he's done for us is to love and encourage each other here in the body, to gather together, And this is discipleship at its finest, people coming together alongside one another and encouraging, saying, hey, keep pushing on. It's okay. This is why small groups are vital. This is why discipleship groups are vital. This is why we're putting such a strong emphasis on community, not necessarily community as a community to say, know this person over there, over here. We want people plugged into community because when things go south, when you need somebody to help pick you up, you've got a group of people that can come around you, pick you up, and encourage you to keep going. It is so easy to walk away from the faith. It is so easy to walk away from the church and all that kind of stuff when you're not invested and plugged into community. But that's a choice that each of us as individuals have to make. We cannot make that decision for you. And so I would encourage you, if you are not plugged in in some way, shape, or form, this isn't a a pitch for small groups, but it is a plea, find one. If you need help, come talk to me, call to Pastor Jimmy, whoever, Jeff, somebody. We will connect you some way. The purpose of the local church is to be a family and a body, a community, all together working with the purpose to advance the gospel of Jesus Christ in communities with a commitment of doing life with one another by loving and encouraging each other to press on. And then we get to our final verse. Hebrews 10, 25 says, Not neglecting to gather as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging each other all the more as you see the day approaching. This text is used a lot to try to convict and pull people back to church. Let me give you the context of what's going on here. And I'm not going to do that today because we're all here. But the context of what's going on is is these believers to follow the ways of Christ meant to risk their life. And so some of them got the idea and said, you know what, I'm not going to go and gather because I'm scared to. I'm, I'm fearful of gathering together. And so they started neglecting it. But the writer is saying, no, there's something important about that. These believers, they were challenged with death. And during times like that, it can be easy to give up on faith altogether. But those who neglect the assembling together cut themselves off from the very means by which Christ feeds, assures, and protects his people. Church, there is something to be said about us being in relationship with one another and being in community with one another. And so let's not neglect the gathering together. Let us not overlook the gathering together. So as a family of believers, we need each other. And we gather together, we're to encourage and love and press on and, 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 and again, and, and push people to keep going forward with their faith until, until Christ makes his return. I don't know about y'all, but man, I'm so thankful for the access that we have, the boldness that we can now go 
no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, that we can just look to God and begin to talk to him. We should never get over. I tell our students this all the time, even adults for that matter. I mean, at, at this point, whoever just wants to listen. We never get over what happened on the cross. That's our hope. That's our assurance. That's what we cling to. We cling to that promise, trusting that God is going to bring it full circle, and he will. He hasn't missed one of them yet. He makes his promises, and he keeps them. And my Bible says, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful yours does too, that in, in Revelation, he's coming back. And he's going to take us with him. And then we're going to be with him forever, free from all the craziness and the chaos. So my, my question then enters this, is, is what more is it going to take for us to get serious about drawing near to him, clinging to him, what more is it going to take? What are we going to keep chasing after? What are we going to keep spending our energy on? Realizing that Jesus is the better way. Tiptoeing around it. Trying to find it in, in whatever high or, or money or anything that you can buy and whatever you can do. When are we going to realize Jesus is the only way? We live a life in response to him. And this, this is for us as believers. We draw near to him. Spending time in prayer, reading our Bibles, growing in our knowledge of Him. Look, I know, I get it. Reading the Bible sometimes can be difficult. Have you read Numbers lately? But it's so worth it. Getting into the Word, letting it meditate in your heart and, and marinate, for that matter, over it. Leading us in, 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 into a way, of, in, into a relationship with Him that is so deeper than than what I think most of American Christianity has, which is just a very foundational level, missing out on so much. Spending time in prayer, spending time in his word, drawing near to him, clinging to Jesus, holding on tight through the trials and through the struggles, holding on to his promises, placing our hope in him, being assured of the promises that we have in Christ and letting that lead us to keep pressing on no matter how difficult life is. And then encouraging each other. It drives me crazy sometimes to hear uh, in churches like just all the petty things that we fight over. I don't like this person. I don't want to go to this small group because of that person. Um, I, don't want to, I don't want to have this person around me because uh, we just don't get along that well. Um, maybe it's time to invest in that relationship. And we start looking at each other as brothers and sisters in Christ, not the enemy. We encourage and we love. We come together as a family and as a community of believers to encourage each other and do good works for the kingdom. And look, I don't know where you are today. I'm not going to appear try to guess. But everybody's response in this room is going to be different. Maybe this morning you've been reminded of, you've, you've just become very lax in your faith. Look, I get it. It's easy. Wake up in the morning and the race begins. You're just going through the, the, the wheels of everything and it's just turning. And then next thing you know, two, three, four weeks gone by or days or whatever. Man, I haven't even spent time in the Word. I get it. And so maybe we're, we're, we need to respond by challenging ourselves to go deeper in that way. Maybe it's with prayer. Again, this, this study that I was reading says that most Christians, most believers don't care about Bible intake and prayer anymore. Can't remember the number, but it was a big number. So let's be challenged to go deeper. Maybe there's something that you've got going on in your life you've been able to give, un unable to give it over to God. I get that. Everybody in this room can relate to that. Maybe you've been going to other things to try to fix it, but the only thing that can fix it is truly focusing on Christ and letting God do the work through it whatever it may be. Would you be willing today to lay that down to him? Say, God, I don't know how you're going to work this out, but I'm going to trust you to work it out. I don't know how I can get over this, but I'm going to trust that through you, I can. Maybe, maybe you're sitting out here and you're like, man, I'm not even sure I'm saved. 
I've never really asked Christ into my heart. As I said earlier, there's, there's one thing you got to do for that. Believe in him. Really, there's two. Believe in what he did, the fact that Jesus lived a perfect life, that he died for you. When he went to the grave, he didn't stay there long. Three days later, he popped back up. We celebrated that last Sunday. And he's still alive today just as much as he was alive then. You believe in that, and then you confess, Jesus, you're Lord over my life. Come into my heart. Lead my life. I don't know what that looks like either, but I believe that you did something. And I believe that something was on that cross that Pastor Andrew was talking about. Cry out to him and tell him that. Believe it in your heart. I'm not going to sit up here and lead you through a prayer or anything like that. That's, that's, that's you. That's on you. But it's that simple. I think we've made salvation and we make assurance in our salvation. We, we make it so complicated, yet it's so simple. And so here's what I want to do this morning. I think everybody in the room has something different on their heart to some degree. And so I want to take a few minutes, and I just want us to, in the quietness of this room, let's draw near to him. Right now, whatever's on your heart, whether you want to sit there, whether you want to come to the altar, whatever it is, like it's, it's wide open. This is, this, is, this is a great time to just cry out to the Lord and respond in whatever way. And then in a few moments, I'll come and I'll close this out. You respond as God leads. Father, we're broken people crying out to you. Father, forgive us for overlooking. Forgive me for overlooking certain areas in our hearts that we just don't want to turn over to you. Father, let us draw near to you, not just at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning, but each and every day clinging to you, clinging to your hope, clinging to your promises. Father, you truly have offered us a better way in Christ. So, Father, I pray that, Father, as we go, as, as we live our lives, Father, that, that our lives will be lived in a representation of your gospel, your love, and the sacrifice that your Son made for us. And that our life would be a true response to that love. Father, let us be people who draw near to you. But not only draw near, but that we cling to you. And as a result of that, being a body of believers, a church that comes together loving and encouraging and supporting each other, even when we may disagree, but keeping you as the main focus, not our preferences, not our, our desires, but God, your desires. God, we thank you for this time of worship. We thank you for everything that's been done here today. Father, let us, let us take that into the world as we seek to live on mission for you, as we seek to make disciples for you. And Father, may you be honored by everything that we say and we do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're a first-time guest with us today, um, swing by the Connect booth. We've got a free gift we'd love to give you. Um, uh, other than that, uh, just a reminder about 5.30 tonight, again, parents, students, anybody really, this entire room, would encourage you to come and, uh, and be a part of, um, of what's going to be a real special night. So um, we love you guys. Praying for you. We'll see you next week.